Welcome to the afternoon session of our um, of our uh, webinar on lithium, on the lithium element. This morning we had a very exciting discussion with uh, Simona Bonafè, David Cole Hamilton, uh, Fernando Rocha, Cristina Estrom, Luigi Lanuzza, and uh, uh, the final uh, um, discussion led by Catherine Sanderson. I thank them very much for this. And now we move forward to uh, other topics. And uh, we start from alternatives to lithium ion batteries, a topic which is absolutely relevant and has been also mentioned this morning. And uh, our speaker will uh, be Philip Adelhelm that will speak about alternatives to lithium ion batteries programs in sodium ion batteries. Let me shortly introduce Philip who got his PhD in physical chemistry in 2007 at the Max Planck Institute for Colloid and Interfaces in Potsdam, and then worked as a postdoc at Utrecht University in the Netherlands studying sodium and magnesium-based hydrogen storage materials. As a young investigator group leader at the Justus Liebig University in Gießen, he explored the cell chemistry of sodium-based batteries. Then in 2015, he became professor at the Institute of Technical and Environmental Chemistry at the University of Vienna in Germany. Since 2019, he has been full professor of physical chemistry at Humboldt University in Berlin and uh, leads a joint research group on operando battery analysis at the Elmont Zentrum in Berlin. One of his main interests is the comparison of lithium ion versus uh, sodium ion battery technology. And we look forward to, to listening from him this topic. Please, Philip. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can see my presentation slides and so on. And uh, well, thanks, Nicola, for introducing me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, to talk a little bit about sodium ion batteries. So my main aim is a little bit to tell you why people work on sodium ion batteries. Um, so what is the state of the art and uh, hopefully uh, I can show you that sodium ion batteries may be really an alternative uh, for the for the future. Um, first of all, I would like to st start off with one slide actually on why we need electric mobility. Um, so I think we saw a couple of uh, great talks already this morning on, on the energy uh, needs and so on. And uh, for, for every basically Western uh, co uh, countries, let's say roughly, this is a number for Germany, but 30% of our end energy use goes to transportation. Right, and the rest is industry, private homes, and others. And as mentioned, this is basically true for most uh, Western countries. And if you really want to save energy, uh, right, to 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 reduce maybe CO2 emissions, there are only a few options that could work, work on a large scale. And uh, one of the reasons why we need to change electric mobility is, is shown here. So this is basically just a short calculation where uh, we try to clarify different units. And one problem is basically that we know our uh, consumption of our gasoline powered cars in, in liters per hundred kilometers. I mean, everybody knows that roughly if we, if we run our car on gasoline, we need eight liters per hundred kilometers. But when we uh, go to electric vehicles, we say we, we look at the consumption in kilowatt hours per hundred kilometers. So it's an issue of different units that we use. But let's just compare these numbers. So eight liters of gasoline per hundred kilometers means an energy content of 70 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers of driving range. And if you look at the uh, consumption of an uh, electric vehicle, you end up with values of around 20 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. And I think this is really uh, the major uh, aspect, I think, of electromobility uh, that we need really maybe just one third to one fourth of the energy compared to cars with combustion engines. So we have a huge lever to reduce actually the energy needs in the transport of the transportation sector by electrifying our our uh, transportation uh, uh, system and that's the major motivation also why people work on lithium-ion batteries uh, and also possible alternatives all right so let's have a look into a typical um, battery for electric vehicles um, this is something that you find quite frequently if you want to buy electric vehicle we have around 60 kilowatt hours of battery a tank, so to say, so that's the battery size, the, the energy content. And this brings you roughly around 350, mil, 350 kilometers of, of driving range. And if you estimate basically the, the elements, so the content of elements in these batteries, 
Uh, you can see there's of course lithium, 6.5 kilograms, cobalt, manganese, nickel, graphite, copper, aluminium, and so on. So you see there's actually quite an amount of, of, um, of materials in these batteries. And of course, this raises questions on the recycling and so forth and the resources. Where do we get these materials from? And I like the discussion today, which color should lithium have in this periodic table? So I already chose a color for lithium. So for me, it's actually orange. Cobalt is red. Um, and other elements basically are less, uh, less critical. And if you look basically at the total battery market worldwide, so this is the, the total battery market in billion US dollars, right? And this is basically the, the timeline from 1990 to 2020. And you can see that essentially only two battery technology, technologies are, are uh, imp relevant, right, on the very large scale. And this is lead acid battery technology, more than 150 years old, but still a highly used and an extremely good battery. And on the other hand, we have lithium-ion batteries, and this market is, is, is rapidly growing in the, in the last years. So that's the yellow uh, bar here. And all the alternatives and other technologies, they are there and they are being researched and developed. But globally, let's say they don't play uh, a significant role. And if you look what batteries are used for, this is shown here. So this is again the, the market of, um, of batteries and uh, the timeline and then the different sectors where, where batteries are being used. Uh, you can see the blue bar here. This is startup batteries, essentially, so lead acid technology. And then we have the brown uh, uh, bars here, and these are portable devices, right? So from the 1990s, we got mobile phones, uh, laptops, and so on. So we have here a portable market, and these are lithium-ion batteries, essentially. And uh, what is recently rapidly increasing is the green bar, and that is electric mobility in any form. And uh, you can see quite recently, so uh, the market for batteries for electric vehicles is larger than all the other uh, markets. So this is a dominant market now and also the driver for the future. So this market is rapidly growing. Uh, this one slide from the European Union, and I have to really say this is from 2017. And uh, it's really important to, to realize when we discuss, let's say, resource risks and, and so on and prices, we always need to look at up-to-date data because this data is, is changing a lot. Also, resources and reserves are changing a lot. And this is, let's say, the latest information I got, although it's already four years old, right? So this is something to keep in mind. But the message is essentially the is unchanged. So this is raw material supply uh, for the European Union uh, for, for battery mat raw materials. And um, we can see actually where is the material coming from. And uh, we can see that the lithium essentially comes from Australia and Chile. Um, the cobalt essentially comes from Congo. Um, graphite essentially comes from China. Uh, so the European Union is not really supplying, let's say, the raw materials to make batteries. And if you go from raw materials to electro materials, uh, the situation is a little bit better for the European Union because we make electrodes. So we make parts of the battery here in the European Union. And this actually can change, right? Whether the resources can change, that may be possible, but maybe not. Uh, but the, the uh, technological development, electrodes, batteries, and so on, this can change. And also the supply of LIVs, and we saw this morning also the, the chart from Christina Edström, that there are many gigafactories being planned and, and currently being built in Germany, uh, in the European Union. Um, this was not the case five to ten years ago, right? We were really scared that maybe there will be no big factories here. Unfortunately, in the last years, a lot of big companies are investing in the European Union to make batteries in the European Union. So uh, the supply of the LIVs here, this for sure will change and Europe will have a significant share here. This was basically a, a look into the past and present. And this is a look into the future. This is the global battery market in, in megawatt hours, right? And we are here, 2021. And these are basically projections. And you can see we have a sort of an exponential growth uh, and this, of course, uh, uh, will require a lot of more materials, uh, a lot of stronger supply chains and so on. So we're just at the beginning, actually, of transitioning to the electrification of our transportation sector. And I do this very quick because I think this has been raised already this morning, this, this issue of resource supply. So there are different scenarios, basically, people look at and uh, there are different publications being published. But the message, message is always the same. Um, electric mobility basically will become extremely important and this will require a lot of more materials. And we may run into some resource uh, conflicts or supply chain issues um, with the uh, pro pro projected growth of, this, uh, of the battery needs. And this relates especially to nickel, cobalt, 
uh, and lithium. This is always the, the elements that are being discussed. And we saw already today also this nice periodic table. And um, uh, in principle, it's nice as an electrochemist or chemist to think about whether we can make batteries based on abundant elements. And this is our playground, our 90 elements. And the question is, can we make batteries that are maybe almost as good as, as lithium-ion batteries but are maybe based on much more abundant elements. And there's, of course, your sodium as a large square, magnesium, so some people dream of magnesium ion batteries or to use silicon in batteries, um, oxygen, uh, phosphorus and so on, titanium, iron, even manganese. I mean, these are basically very well available elements. And if you could make a good battery out of that, this would be, of course, a nice, a nice thing to maybe complement lithium ion battery or maybe to partially replace it in certain applications. So how well do sodium ion batteries work? How far are we actually in realizing that technology? And this is something I want to show you on the next uh, slides. So this is an overview of how a lithium ion battery works. Uh, you saw already uh, sketches like that this, this morning. So of course we have two electrode materials uh, and both electrode materials reversibly store lithium ions, right? And they shuttle back and forth during charging and discharging. And the materials that are being used are lithium cobalt oxide, then these compounds here, they're called NMC, so nickel uh, manganese cobalt materials or nickel cobalt aluminium uh, materials, lithium iron phosphate, and to some extent also lithium manganese oxide. And on the negative electrode, we largely have graphite and in some niche, niche applications, lithium titanate. And also here I mark basically all elements that are critical in, in, in red and orange. And the green ones are essentially the ones that are very promising in order to make low-cost materials, uh, low-cost batteries. So if you go to sodium ion batteries on this anode side, you want to work basically with compounds based not on maybe not on graphite, but at least based on carbon, uh, titanium, sodium, of course. The current collector in lithium ion batteries on the negative electrode is always copper. It has to be copper, right? So there's no good solution uh, to replace copper so far. In the sodium ion batteries, actually, you can use aluminium. Right? So maybe you have a, a, a chance here to save, let's say, some money and maybe to, to um, put away with the pressure of the supply chain of, of copper. And on the negative electrode, of course, we have to find materials that are very rich in manganese, iron, sodium, maybe nickel is still okay to some extent, but iron manganese would be nice. Of course, not cobalt. Right? Cobalt is, is a no-go. Um, so in terms of abundance, of course, lithium is more than, uh, or sodium is more than 1,000 times more abundant than lithium. So that's basically the selling point of this technology. Although, of course, we need to replace really more than just lithium. As mentioned, you need to replace uh, cobalt, copper, and so on. So the, the challenge is actually much larger than just replacing lithium by sodium. Um, the iron radius of sodium is roughly 30% larger than, than lithium. And that's the interesting part for chemists because this larger iron size has a huge effect on the chemistry. And I will show you also on the following slides two examples on, on, on the effect of the iron size on the, uh, on, on, on the electrode reaction of, of uh, such a battery. But you can also see lithium ion and sodium ion batteries in principle, they look the same. So the concept is the same. We use the same uh, principle of, of shuttling sodium ions between two electrodes. And this is also one of the key advantages of sodium ion batteries. We can use the same production lines. Um, um, that we have for lithium ion batteries. And that's one of the greatest challenges for any alternative battery chemistry, uh, when you have to set up basically a new technology, a new production lines, um, this is very expensive. And lithium ion batteries became very, very cheap in the last years. So it's very difficult actually to have a business case. And sodium ion technology is one of the very few chances where we can take full, of one, full advantage of the economy of scale of lithium ion batteries, right? So they can be, cheap from the very beginning, potentially cheap from the very beginning, um, and therefore might be really a competitor in, the, in, the, in this, this game of, of uh, different battery technologies. Other potential benefits that are being mentioned, and they, I think they have to be yet to be proven, um, we have potentially better safety because this battery can be fully discharged, and we have very likely also a step better stability of the electrolytes. Um, lower cost uh, might be uh, possible, Less resource risks, of course, um, and some people claim that these batteries may provide a faster charging and discharging capability. But on the other hand, and that's, let's say, uh, the, the drawback, so to say, sodium ion batteries, they have a very high energy density, far higher than lead acid batteries or nickel metal hydride batteries, but they are somewhat lower than lithium ion batteries. 
So if it's really only about energy density, it's very difficult to beat lithium ion technology. Right? That's the beauty about lithium. Lithium gives you always a very high cell voltage in a battery, and that's very hard to reach by any other uh, battery chemistry. Okay, this is basically a, lab, a map of the, of the world of companies and startups that look at sodium ion batteries. Uh, I do this very quickly, but we have in Europe uh, quite some companies and startups that are being interested. Tiamat from France, Ferradion from the, from, uh, the UK, uh, and of course we have a lot of players from, uh, from China. And also here, this is the literature overview. So there had been, there was not actually a lot of research in the last years on sodium ion battery, but from the uh, roughly from 10 years ago, we have a rapid increase in publications. And this is also a little of a sign uh, how, how dynamic this development currently is. And there's a lot of things still to be discovered. So right now we have roughly 800 publications per year. Uh, and compared to lithium ion batteries, we have 3,500, right? So it's roughly 20%. Right, so 20% uh, of, of what is being published of, on lithium ion batteries. So it's small, but it's actually quite significant already. This is one slide of what is possible today. Um, so Ferrarion from the UK is uh, showing basically cells on the website. You can't buy them yet, right? But they have basically specification sheets, and you can see this is for the battery experts among you that they have actually quite decent properties. They are not as high in energy density like lithium ion batteries, but they are already quite quite good. And a very important startup from China is Haina Battery, and they presented uh, in 2018 an electric vehicle. And uh, in June this year, a one megawatt hour energy store for microgrid. And this is a huge battery. This is not just playing around with new cell chemistries. I mean, if you manage to put up a one megawatt hour stationary energy store, this means the technology is already quite far. And how far this technology is, and this is maybe also for the battery um, um, experts among you, is, is shown here. So maybe you can just focus on the right side of this slide. And this is the, the amount of cycles. So how often can you charge and re recharge this battery? And you can see you can reach 5,000 cycles and you lose only 20% of your capacity. And this is really, really good for new technology. So I would say sodium ion technology in principle works, right? So this is one of the few, let's say, alternatives that really work over many, many cycles and can be produced, probably also at low cost. Of course, the question is whether there's a business case, right, compared to lithium-ion batteries. But in principle, the technology, I think uh, there's no doubt that this technology works. The last important example is CATL. This is the, one of the largest lithium-ion battery manufacturers uh, worldwide. And I do this also very quick. So they announced in July this year that they want to mix lithium-ion and sodium-ion batteries in a battery pack. And that is quite a unique idea. I think that was not really thought through. Uh, a year ago or so. So this is very new. And what they want to do is they want to make a battery pack for electric vehicles. And in this illustration, two thirds of the batteries are sodium ion batteries and one third are lithium ion batteries. So they want to basically combine the advantages of both technologies, sodium ion batteries being maybe cheaper, maybe less resource restricted. They have a very good low temperature performance and can be charged and discharged very rapidly but they have a lower energy density and therefore they put in lithium ion batteries to, to basically as a booster for a higher energy density of the complete battery pack. Um, this is announced and they want to do this within just a few years. So I think it will be very interesting to see whether really they, they manage to, to put this into application. Uh, but as mentioned, CATL is not a startup, so it's a very big company. And uh, if they commit to, to a technology, this is really a I think a clear sign that uh, they at least they see some promise in, in this technology. Um, now we turn to the chemistry side. I just brought a, a very few slides on, uh, on what actually happens when you look at electrode reactions and you exchange the ion. So we go from lithium to sodium. So one famous cathode material is lithium cobalt oxide. And of course, you can ask what happens when in place of lithium I use sodium. And the same actually you can see here when you take graphite what happens when instead of lithium, you try to intercalate sodium into a graphite lattice. And this is shown here. So these are so-called voltage profiles of, of these electrode materials. And this is the green one here for lithium cobalt oxide. And this is actually exactly what you would like to have in a battery. So it's a very high voltage and a high capacity, um, low O potentials uh, and highly reversible process. And if you replace lithium by sodium, 
then you see you get a completely different behavior. And that's chemistry, right? Because the sodium ion is larger. And at the very end, uh, this leads to the fact that you have much more ordering phenomena in these materials, much more phase transitions, and everything becomes more complex. So in general, the chemistry of, of uh, sodium uh, electrodes is much richer for, for, for these layered oxides. So the, there's more, there are more opportunities, so to say, to play around with, with different elements and different uh, compositions. Um, and you have to somehow deal with this very different behavior compared to, to, to lithium. Um, so this is one example, actually. And what you can do is, and this is what many, many people do, is we're trying to mix now these um, layered materials. And this is one shown here. So this, this does not contain any, any cobalt anymore, but a lot of manganese. Um, and uh, the funny thing is this particular composition contains also lithium. But this way, actually, you can, you can achieve that this, this stepwise profile that you have, these lot of steps, they disappear, and you get such a sloping behavior, which is much more uh, um, useful, let's say, for battery application. Um, and I just give you one more one, one brief uh, example on graphite, uh, because many of you know these graphite intercalation compounds. So lithium easily intercalates into graphite, right, forming LiC6, that's the compound. And all the other alkali ions basically also do this. Potassium intercalates in rubidium, but sodium does not. And that's quite interesting, but it turns out that actually within the series of alkali metals, not sodium is the exception, but lithium. So the fact that lithium intercalates and everybody of us carries graphite uh, in, in, in his pocket, in the smartphone, and lithium is being intercalated, that this actually works is, is a very special case. So in principle, it should not work, uh, but uh, due to special interactions between the graphite lattice and lithium ions, uh, this compound can form, and this is why lithium ion battery works. And what we do is actually, in, in, in my group, for example, we look at uh, alternatives to intercalate sodium ions into graphite, so sodium ions do not intercalate into this lattice. And what we try actually to do is we intercalate solvated ions. So they are much larger, but we co-intercalate sol solvent molecules into the graphite lattice. And therefore, the electrode reaction becomes reversible. And I think I already crossed my time limit. So I think I just actually um, conclude uh, very briefly. So sodium ion batteries are a drop-in technology. We can use the same manufacturing lines like lithium ion batteries, which is a big advantage. Uh, there are a lot of possibilities right now in materials development. We have a very diverse chemistry. Uh, many startups exist and also larger companies now commit to sodium ion technology. Uh, but we still wait actually for mass markets. So um, there are not too many examples yet on, on, uh, uh, on, on the market. But in the next years, hopefully, we will really see that sodium ion batteries will be uh, on sale and, and maybe find a market niche. And replacing lithium by sodium is not enough. Of course, if you think about batteries, we also have to replace other elements like cobalt and then nickel and so on. Yeah, and with this, I would like to close. Nicola, thank you very much again. Uh, and um, I'm happy to discuss this, this uh, lecture later on in the, in the plenary discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Philip, for this uh, lecture. It is very interesting to see how developments are being done in, in the sodium uh, chemistry of, of batteries. That's, that's really great. And it is also interesting. They are also trying to, to use it in, in cars, and they are, there are plans for that and a very smart solution for that. Very good. So uh, the questions will come later. In the meantime, we received the, uh, the results of the, uh, of the poll, and it seems that uh, orange is still the preferred uh, color from our uh, um, attendees. But there has been some people that moved from yellow to green, so we have a more optimistic view after the discussion that lithium is, uh, is more abundant than initially thought and uh, the red is more or less the same so possibly uh, the discussion is moving towards orange but this will be open to further discussion of course so let's move to the second uh, speaker the second speaker uh, is going to be professor paul anderson from the university of birmingham he will talk about recycling lithium ion batteries and let me first briefly introduce uh, Paul Anderson, who is Professor of Strategic Elements and Material Sustainability in the School of Chemistry at the University of Birmingham in the UK and Co-Director 
of the Birmingham Center for Strategic Elements and Critical Materials. He is also principal investigator for the Faraday Institution really project dedicated to the development of new technology for efficient end of life management of automotive lithium ion batteries. The synthesis and development of improved materials for energy applications has been the major focus of his research for over two decades, along with the efficient husbandry of the Earth's elemental resources. Paul was academic lead for the Birmingham Policy Commission Securing Technology Critical Materials for Britain, chaired by the former government chief scientific advisor, uh, Sir John Beddington. And he is a member of Innovate UK Sustainable Battery Steering Group and the Faraday Institution's Expert Panel. Earlier this year, uh, Paul gave evidence to the House of the Lords Science and Technology Committee on the role of batteries and fuel cells in achieving net zero. Please, Paul. Oh, well, uh, thank you, Nicola, for that kind introduction. And uh, uh, also, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks to the organisers uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak this afternoon. Uh, I would also like to thank all this morning's speakers and uh, uh, Philip as well for uh, preparing the ground so well for my talk. So uh, rather than uh, waste too much of uh, precious time on introduction, I, I thought what I would do this afternoon is I, I would try and outline some of the key challenges that we see in recycling of lithium ion batteries and then uh, show some case studies of how we can begin to perhaps plot a way forward to improve uh, some, of, some of these issues. So people often say to me, what is the problem with uh, recycling of lithium ion batteries from EVs? We know how to do that. And I think um, actually that's true. We do broadly know how to recycle many of the main components of lithium ion batteries. Um, I think it's worth right at the start just uh, orienting ourselves with regard to the size of the industry that there will be. Uh, you can see all sorts of figures about the size of the industry and how rapidly it's growing. But to put it in perspective, we calculated that if we had 3% of the global fleet was electrified, that would be enough to take all the electric vehicle battery packs out and stretch in a line all the way around their circumference. So the point I'm trying to make there is this is going to be a very, very large industry at some point, perhaps not immediately, but at some point. So it is important that we learn how to maximize throughput of the industry and maximize the efficiency and the atomic efficiency of our processes. Very importantly, we also need to maximize the amount of battery materials recovered. Now we've heard this morning about ambitious goals, very uh, challenging goals of getting 90% of those uh, materials in the batteries recovered. The size of the industry will be such that even 10% will be a very large amount of waste. So it's really important to maximize as much as we can uh, the amount of battery materials that are recovered. In order to do that, we really need to maximize the value of the recovered materials as well. This is important because at the moment, really, the only materials that are worth economically taking out of the batteries are cobalt, perhaps, maybe nickel, and not a lot else. Um, if we want to maximize uh, you know, the recovery of materials, we need to improve the economics of this. In this regard, we need to be very, very careful about ideas of downcycling, because uh, when we consider the size that this industry will be, uh, although undoubtedly there will be markets and important markets for many materials that come out of the batteries that are not going back into an electric vehicle, there may well be many materials that there will be no uh, uh, sort of a sizable market for. I'm thinking of things like plastics uh, and perhaps the organic compounds. It is important, I think, that we start to think of maximum amount of circularity in the EV industry uh, in order to deal with this uh, issue. Uh, strategically, the EU, I think, has recognised that uh, with its uh, uh, 
directive on uh, the amount of recycled lithium that must go in new batteries, that this is important. Uh, and so it's possible that in the future, there will be more regulation that will drive uh, recycling rather than economic value. Uh, in terms of lithium, this is a really good thing to do on the ground, simply that it's likely that the recovery of lithium uh, from the battery, the secondary sources, will actually be less damaging environmentally in terms of energy cost and also in terms of water use uh, and things like that than the primary production. So this is really important. Uh, if we want to improve the economics of the industry, we will, of course, need to minimise cost. And on top of that, we want to minimise the waste from the industry. Now, this is not just through materials that are not recovered, but actually it's any waste that's generated in that recycling process, solvents, water that needs remediation or whatever. What we ideally want to do is move to zero waste recycling. It's worth also remembering at this point that zero emission vehicles require more than putting uh, vehicles on the road that are zero emission at the point of use. In order to be zero emission, we need to decarbonize manufacturing, we need to decarbonize the grid, and importantly, we also need to decarbonize the decommissioning process and clean up. And that uh, too often, I think, is forgotten. Okay. Uh, we've seen this uh, periodic table um, uh, uh, already this afternoon. As an inorganic chemist, I, I, I reserve the right to have a periodic table in my, my talk. And this one expertly, I think, captures some of the issues involved. So in terms of EV batteries, the important metals that have been mentioned are lithium, cobalt, of course, nickel. Uh, Philip mentioned there's quite a lot of copper in electric vehicle, not just in the cells, but actually in the rest of the packs. And one that's quite often forgotten, though uh, has been mentioned, is carbon in terms of graphite. Graphite is, in fact, um, uh, a critical material on the EU list. Uh, and uh, uh, at the moment, next to none from, uh, uh, from electric vehicles or, or lithium ion batteries is actually uh, recycled. It's mostly uh, burnt. So the EU has been aware of these things for many years, of course. And as uh, uh, was mentioned in the introduction earlier this year, we tried to, uh, with some success, actually get the UK government to take up some of these issues as well uh, with our policy commission uh, chaired by Sir John Beddington. So why is it, uh, what are the main problems with, um, with recycling? Well, I'm going to start at the beginning, and the beginning is not actually in the materials and the cells. The beginning is uh, with the packs themselves. So this is a paper taken from our nature paper of a few years ago, and it shows three popular models at the time. And it was chosen to illustrate the three main format factors of uh, cells. And in each case, the cells are arranged into modules, though some manufacturers are looking for module-free designs now. And ultimately, then they're put together and wired up in quite complicated packs. So the point uh, that lies behind, that I'm trying to make is that actually, in order to get at the materials within the batteries, you have to dismantle a stage, and there's an awful lot of work that needs to be done to get to that point. So let's briefly look at the value. Uh, again, we've seen similar slides already. The battery pack is roughly uh, a third of electric vehicle. The majority of the value in that is in the cell, uh, three quarters, and it, of the cell components, mostly the active materials, the anode and the cathode, are where the value lies. But this is misleading because uh, although that's where the value of the battery pack lies, in terms of cost of recycling, over 50% of the cost can be used up over 50% of the value recoverable from the cell, I should say, can be used up in actually dismantling the cells, uh, dismantling the packs down to module or cell level, uh, testing them and moving them in 
uh, uh, to recycling. So that's before you even break into a cell, uh, there are enormous costs. The reason for that is because there's several hazards involved. There's an electrical hazard. There's a potential fire hazard uh, if a cell gets broken and also a toxicity hazard if, if materials escape from the cells. So it's important that we actually reduce this cost. At the moment, it's largely be, being done by trained engineers or, or technicians, and it's largely being done manually. Our approach to try and uh, address some of these issues has been to move as quickly as possible into automating uh, this process. Uh, what we've done is we have used artificial intelligence methods uh, to develop uh, a, a robust visual system that can see the battery pack and then uh, actually uh, can uh, machine, learn, machine learning to actually identify the components. What you see in the video that's running now is not actually labelled by us. It's labelled by the deep neural network that we've used to learn, uh, the out, the, uh, learn the layout of this pack. And when we put this technology together, we can see the removal, uh, combine this and remove consecutive components uh, by the cobots in the lab. And what we're currently in the print, uh, this includes... Uh, of course, moving difficult objects to recognize uh, such as deform, uh, deformable parts. And actually the next step in this is to move this technology uh, into our industrial park in Birmingham, Tysley Energy Park, where we can actually uh, try it out uh, on full scale uh, rather than uh, safer uh, mock-ups in the lab. Okay, so... Uh, Another thing we've done, of course, is that the cost of um, the cost of recycling, a lot of the cost of recycling is taken up, in fact, in testing uh, as that dismantling process is being done. Uh, so we have actually uh, used our neural networks uh, and AI to combine with our testing protocols developed at the University of Newcastle on Relib to actually automate uh, that testing process as well. Uh, and the aim is ultimately to take uh, human intervention as much as possible out of that dismantling process. So one of the things we've learned in looking at current packs and trying to automate the processes is what parts are really difficult and what parts are, are relatively easy. Uh, and what we will do with this uh, information is try and feed this into design of packs and modules uh, to try and uh, improve the uh, ability to automate dismantling processes. This is something that is largely missing from the way that uh, packs are put together uh, at currently. Uh, they're put together for all sorts of different reasons, but really recyclability is not something that's top of the agenda, and it really needs to be to reduce the costs of that recycling process. So as a chemist, what can we bring to this um, the table. Uh, this is a paper that's going to be published shortly from Relib uh, researchers based at the University of Leicester. And we're doing a lot of work uh, with, um, with uh, uh, our partners in Leicester and also uh, some companies in the UK looking at issues of debondable adhesives. One of the things that causes a lot of problems in recycling is uh, the difficulty of dealing with glues and resins. And so the idea here is to design uh, an adhesive that has a fatal flaw, something that under an external stimulus, be it ultrasound, UV light, electrical, thermal, chemical, or magnetic, will actually enable it to be debonded uh, uh, straightforwardly at the end of its life. So that's just one small example of how we can bring a more chemical approach to, to bear there. So briefly, if we look at current recycling options, we really have uh, uh, two that are, are, are being taken up. Uh, one is pyrometallurgy, which is essentially putting uh, your modules, cells, or parts of the battery into a high temperature furnace. This, the advantages of this is that it's been shown to work for copper, nickel, and also uh, for cobalt, nickel, and also copper, and it's relatively safe. 
The drawbacks are it's expensive, difficult to scale up. A majority of the material is actually lost. All the graphite, all the organic material is burnt, and the aluminium on the cathode current collectors is oxidized to aluminium oxide. Uh, there's a long workup process, sometimes re often requires a gate fee, high energy consumption, and the flue gas needs scrubbing. All over the world, people are tr rushing to try and bring in hydrometallurgical routes. These are inexpensive, comparatively inexpensive, easier to scale up, higher yield, and minimal exhaust emission. But they also have a, a particular problem, which is they give lower purity and lower value material streams. They require wastewater treatment, often in solvent disposal. And the processes themselves are actually pretty complicated. I won't dwell on this slide. I have two. Th this is actually a, a, an illustration of some of the uh, commercial processes that are in operation. Uh, it is actually a simplified version, believe it or not. And the two points that I want to make with this slide are firstly, that the recycling processes are very complicated. And secondly, that almost all of them start with this stage, which is uh, involves shredding the battery modules or cells uh, under inert atmosphere, water spray, or, or, or other means to actually avoid a fire risk, suppress a fire risk, uh, and also uh, take away toxic uh, components. So this has been likened. If we look at this, this is the shredding route that has been uh, outlined uh, below. And this is where the industry is going with this. Now, the reason industry does this, and this is recycling 1.0, is because you can very quickly and reasonably conveniently get uh, your um, get your uh, uh, material, your battery pack to the stage where you uh, separate out the metals and, and the plastics and the so-called active materials, black mass, which can then go on to be, to be recycled. The problem with this is that someone has likened it to if you were trying to recycle the ingredients out of an expensive uh, layered gato, uh, a cake, Actually, your first step should not be to put it into a food mixer and mix everything up as much as possible. The downside of that is that uh, you end up with lower purity, extra steps in the chemical or physical uh, workup, and that in turn uh, results in uh, can result in higher costs. So one of the things that's being looked at in some places in the Far East uh, manually is to actually separate the cells into separate uh, anode and cathode uh, material streams. Now, if you think about it, a battery is essentially a laminar structure. In many ways, it's already separated for you. If this can be done, uh, the you face higher space-time yields, higher purity, and lower cost in the recycling process. The problem, of course, is how can it be done safely? So again, at Birmingham, we've been looking at uh, automating this process. What you see here, this one involves looking at cutting a pouch cell uh, open under an argon or a CO2 gas blanket uh, through a laser. We're not convinced that the laser is the best option. We're looking at other cutting options currently. And we're also looking at optimizing this uh, on other types of form factors, such as cylindrical cells. Another thing that you can do is once you actually uh, get uh, your, uh, get your uh, uh, cell recovered from the, uh, uh, okay, I, I seem to have a, a slide a slide issue here. Okay, once you can get your uh, cell recovered uh, from, uh, uh, okay. Um, uh, uh, what I was trying to show is our patented delamination process, which is a hundred times greater yield uh, than, than other conventional processes in actually very, very quickly. Uh, getting the active materials out of uh, the battery. And the, the good news about this is it can be uh, integrated with our automated dismantling process. 
It can also work very, very quickly. And it's also mild on the active uh, materials, which leaves them uh, easier to regenerate or even use for direct recycling, where you use the materials uh, directly to make new uh, electrodes uh, from them. Uh, some other uh, uh, work for Relab that we have is uh, some work on selective leaching, a second patent. What you can see here is uh, we have a blended cathode, such as Nissan Generation 1 LEAF, also some other vehicles that are uh, being made in the United States currently. And what you can see is that you have a mixture of different types of um, uh, uh, materials, a manganese rich, uh, and uh, a layered material that has more nickel and copper. After the treatment, uh, the manganese rich phase is essentially being removed and you end up with a more even distribution of manganese, nickel and cobalt. The good news from this is that we can use either the leachate or indeed the layered oxide to regenerate uh, current generation or uh, future generation NMC materials. Uh, in fact, we can upcycle these to uh, other compositions uh, containing higher nickel as well. Finally, uh, because the, the extraction routes are actually quite mild on the materials, we had a look at doing uh, some direct recycling uh, routes. And uh, this is a uh, heat treatment of cathode material, this time from a generation two Nissan leaf, an NMC material. And the interesting thing, we directly uh, made cells again uh, from material recovered. And what we found interestingly, that there were no obvious changes to the secondary particle morphology. And this is really important because there is an awful lot of materials engineering that actually goes in uh, to the, the, the way that the materials are delivered uh, to the cells and a lot of the value added by manufacturing processes is actually not just in making the material, it is in making the material from the components, but uh, also in engineering the surface uh, and the morphology properly for that. And that of course is particularly uh, important, uh, not for uh, uh, materials that are uh, contain precious metals like nickel and cobalt, but even more important uh, for uh, a cathode material such as LFP, where direct recycling is probably the only viable, uh, economically viable uh, route. So we also have been working with our partners in Scotland uh, about uh, bioremoval. Uh, I won't go into details, but we can remove, precipitate all the metals sequentially uh, using different bacteria. And the, pro the process has now moved al along to gene editing the bacteria. They have identified, for instance, certain genes that are specifically selective for cobalt precipitation and nickel precipitation. And we're trying to engineer new strains of bacteria that will improve on natural bacteria in order to do that job. And so that's a, a flavor of some of the issues, I think, that are around some of the non-chemical issues in many cases that are around lithium-ion battery recycling, what the way forward might be. And I'll leave you uh, just with a slide showing the Relib team and the uh, collaborators uh, on the project, if I may. So uh, back to you, Nicola. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for this uh, talk and uh, we learned a lot of things about what's going on on lithium battery recycling. It's a complicated uh, issue and uh, we will discuss more deeply later on. Uh, now we go to another uh, presentation from the United States. Our, our uh, speaker is coming from there. He is there, he's based there. And uh, uh, as chemists, we are worried because uh, lithium has been used for many, many decades in, in different uses. So we wanted also to uh, discuss this point. It is not only batteries, it is something else. Lithium is, is many, many applications. And about some of them, uh, John Cochrane is, is talking about uh, uh, this, and uh, the title of his talk is Glass, the Handheld Lithium. And uh, 
John holds a Bachelor of Science in Ceramic Engineering from Missouri University of Science and Technology. In 2005, he joined Corning Incorporated in Lexington in USA as a melting process engineer. Then he held a variety of progressively responsible roles and is currently manager Gorilla Glass Raw Materials and Glass Technology. So I, I ask uh, John to join us from the US and thank you for participating to our discussion. Please, John. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'd like to spend a little bit of time, as you mentioned, talking about the importance of lithium in glass. Uh, but first, I want to just really briefly introduce uh, Corning as well. Corning Incorporated has long been an innovator in material science uh, with expertise in glass and ceramic science and optical physics. Um, the track record of innovation for Corning uh, includes uh, exciting things such as the first glass bulbs for Edison, uh, the ability to economically mass produce those, uh, and then just a few others that I always think are very interesting milestones on this list. Uh, the ceramic substrates at the heart of catalytic converters, uh, the first low loss optical fibers, which revolutionized our communications, uh, and more recently, advanced glasses uh, for things such as wearable devices. Uh, so not just smartphones, but smart watches. I think it's a, it's a long history uh, and an impressive line of innovation. Uh, Corning does this, accomplishes this through five major business segments. Uh, Corning's Gorilla Glass, which we'll focus on shortly, uh, is focused in the specialty materials segment of the business. Uh, Corning accomplishes this, uh, this record of innovation by focusing in it, its energy. We're best at three core technologies, glass science, ceramic science, and optical physics, uh, and four engineering and manufacturing platforms, and through five market access platforms. Uh, so by focusing 80% or more of our resources on opportunities that use at least two of these columns, uh, we're able to see an increase in our likelihood of success for new innovations. Uh, I'm talking specifically around mobile consumer electronics as a map uh, market access platform. Uh, this group created the market for thin, tough cover glasses. Uh, and today, Corning's Gorilla Glass is featured on billions of devices worldwide, uh, and we continue to innovate here. So just like the smartphone, Corning's Gorilla Glass has evolved over the last decade. Uh, from its inception in 2007, uh, with the first Gorilla Glass that was brought to market, uh, to now all the way through uh, 2021 and more recently, 2022, you see over 8 billion devices uh, contain Corning's Gorilla Glass. So the evolution of chemistry, chemically strengthened glass, uh, it pairs the glass composition with time and temperature in order to balance surface penetration and stress with glass relaxation. Uh, so the first Gorilla Glasses really took advantage of basic ion exchange principles uh, to create damage resistant surfaces, right? And at a concept there, the most basic ion exchange occurs when a glass containing one mobile ion is exposed to a source of a different mobile ion, right? It's dipping the glass in a salt bath uh, as illustrated by the pictures. Our next generations of Gorilla Glasses really began to improve drop performance through depth of layer, right? So this was controlling the level of penetration in the salt bath. More recently, the addition of lithium allowed us to improve inner diffusion, which allows for faster exchange at similar temperatures. 
the size delta between lithium and sodium, or specifically between lithium and the salt bath, is able to increase the stress, uh, which in turn helps us reduce flaw propagation. Right? So in order to accomplish this, uh, as we've talked about a lot today, there's a couple of different forms of available lithium currently in the market. Uh, I break them into the two categories of chemicals and minerals. Um, the hydroxide form um, is not really suitable for the glass manufacturing environment. So we focus more on the carbonates. The carbonates offer a chemically consistent and high purity uh, with very stable. Uh, and the minerals allow us to also add a little flexibility and additional volume. The minerals in general are limited by impurities, uh, the alkali, alkaline earth impurities and the minerals become compositional limiting factors. Where this all ties together for us uh, is in the sustainability of this market. What we're really worried about and what we're looking forward to is the ability to manage lithium sources through the future. So with regards to lithium, uh, we're looking at and expect responsible mining from our suppliers. And we believe that recycling should become an integral part of the lithium life cycle to support the demand in the environment. So at Corning, as we continue to innovate, right, we also believe how we do things is important. Uh, so the recycling of this content uh, and the supply of lithium will be one of our focuses as we continue to go forward. Uh, I know it's uh, late in the afternoon of the presentation, uh, relatively short on the conversation here, uh, but I think it's critical to note that there are other significant sources of lithium consumption besides uh, the EV or the battery industry. Uh, the glass industry continues to grow. I think the penetration of uh, smart devices and our, uh, as consumers, our requirements of those mobile consumer electronics continues to increase uh, as we manage uh, scratch and drop performance throughout time. Uh, and so as the demand for that grows, so does our lithium consumption uh, in parallel to all of these other sources. Uh, as I mentioned, very, very short conversation here, but uh, really appreciate being part of the day uh, and looking forward to uh, the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for uh, showing us that uh, the use of lithium goes well beyond batteries. And uh, we sort of look at, at outside the, the, our mobile phone. We have been looking inside for a long time, batteries and, and circuitries. Now, this morning, we have seen the outside. That's, that's important, too, because we touch it every day, of course. And uh, I also... Okay. Nikolai, I'm sorry. I, I will say one other comment. Um, there's a lot of interest in glass ceramics, um, you know, I, I will comment that my presentation is very light on the conversation of glass ceramics. Uh, I think there are a few very important uses of lithium in the glass ceramic space. Uh, but, uh, you know, that conversation, especially as it concerns uh, some newer products, is pretty tightly controlled. Right. But uh, I think glass and glass ceramics plays a big role in lithium consumption also. Yes. Um, well, uh, we have now time for the break. I'm particularly thankful to you, John, because you woke up very early this morning to be with us <laughs> at 10 a.m. Central European time. So thank you so much, really. Uh, we, we now start again with our session, um, uh, the second part of the afternoon session. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Daniel Cios from the European Commission DG Growth. His uh, talk is uh, titled, How can the EU, the EU uh, ensure a secure and sustainable supply of raw materials for the energy transition? And uh, just a short presentation of Daniel. Daniel Cios got interested in raw materials markets 
and policy during his studies in European affairs in 2010. In his research, he took up the research question on how the EU could ensure supplies of rare earths. At that time, he did not expect that this academic interest would continue in his future professional career. First, by being a consultant on issues related to supplies of raw materials and performing economic and technological analysis of various innovative projects that gave him an understanding of the industry. In 2018, he joined the European Commission in the Unit for Energy Intensive Industries and Raw Materials within the Directorate General for Internal Markets, Industry, Entrepreneurship and uh, Small Medium Enterprises. His main responsibilities are EU activities on raw materials, particularly for batteries and the Horizon Europe Framework Program on Research and Innovation in the area of raw materials. Please, Daniel. Thank you very much. Uh, can you just confirm that you also can see the slide? Yes, yes. Perfect. Very well. very, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, when I saw the invitation for this event, I started thinking about chemistry. And you know how it goes with humanists thinking about chemistry? I never liked chemistry. In school, I never understood it. I avoided it. It was my worst subject. So here I am 20 years later talking about lithium on an event organized by the European Chemical Society. Can it be more unexpected? So you know how it goes? I like the invitation also for another reason. Here in Brussels, we debate all the time about raw materials. Two weeks ago, we had the Raw Materials Week organized by my, my, by my unit, full week of it events on raw materials policy, economics, uh, um, res uh, research and innovation. All our activities were presented. Last week, we had the debate in the European Parliament and uh, the adoption of the resolution of the Parliament on on a strategy, on European strategy for critical raw materials. But we also debate with environmental NGOs, with uh, companies, researchers, and experts from the chemistry like you. And I think it is a really great opportunity that you organize this meeting fully de dedicated to lithium with uh, all the variety uh, from politicians, policies, uh, research and innovation, uh, geolip political aspects. I think this is a really good overview of lithium. So I'm very grateful to be here and present the perspective from the European Commission. Uh, in my presentation, I will. Uh, I want to talk about a few things. First is uh, why actually do we talk about raw materials? and particularly critical raw materials. Why are they the focus of uh, politicians and also policy-making institutions? And what is the European Commission strategy when it comes to the access to critical raw materials? And as it was mentioned in the introduction, one of my main responsibilities is Horizon Europe. So I will show you in practice what, what is the what is the how we provide support when it comes to research innovation when it comes to raw materials and we talk about raw materials because they are of course needed for the energy transition we had already some presentations today on uh, some of the elements so i will not go into detail but we will need raw materials uh, for green technologies for wind turbines, for solar panels, for batteries, uh, uh, batteries in electric vehicles, for permanent magnets, electric motors. We will need that for the green transition, but also for the digital applications. This is all combined. And uh, the demand for these raw materials will rise. And actually, this, this future demand of raw materials is a is subject to uh, warriors analysis by warriors institutions. And this is where I start. For example, the OECD is uh, performing such a, performed such an analysis in 2019 about the global uh, use of raw materials. As we can see here, uh, 
uh, all the raw materials are expected to grow here in this analysis to 2060. So we see one international institution showing that demand will be growing constantly. We have another international institution, the International Energy Agency. Now, this is an energy agency, but they decided also to have a report looking at raw materials because these raw materials will be needed for the energy transition. And again, they also proje have projections that the demand will be constantly growing uh, for the raw materials here till uh, uh, the time frame is till 2040. And last but not least, it is also the European Commission that has a foresight study. And I highlight this because this is our first foresight study when it comes to raw materials. We never looked uh, forward to the future when uh, looking at figures on raw materials. So we performed the first foresight study in 2020 accompanying the list of critical raw materials. Uh, we focused uh, on uh, on the raw materials needed for some specific sectors. Here, as an example, I, I show you figures when it comes to battery raw materials, as you can see in two uh, different uh, timeframes, 2030 and 2050. And uh, we have also a figure for lithium. So you can see that demand uh, will rise uh, around 15 times till 2030 and uh, over 40 times in 2050. Of course, this all depends on the different scenarios you put into and different figures you analyze. So these are not uh, strict uh, uh, figures, figures here that show these are subject to various changes. So we cannot say specifically that it will be 15 times. It might be depending on what you look at. Yeah. So we are very careful in, in, our, in our analysis and projections. But as I said, we also we we look look to the to the past, and that's how we develop our list of critical uh, raw materials. It is a tool we have since two thousand eleven uh, <clears throat> uh, to know what raw materials are critical for the EU. So, meaning which ones are high economic impact and which ones are high high supply risk. I will go into the methodology in my next slides. Here, I just want to show you that we have now 30 raw materials on the list. Now, the list is adopted every three years. Since 2011, this list has been growing. So the amount of critical raw materials that are critical for the EU is never decreasing. It's always growing. And in the last assessment, we have four new raw materials on the list. Those are the ones that are in the uh, orange color, and one of those raw materials is lithium. So lithium is a new raw material on the list. It wasn't there on the uh, 2017 edition, and exactly this this uh, uh, appearance uh, in the 2020 counts because of the rising demand for uh, battery raw materials and batteries in, in general. So you, you see the result. There is a new technology coming up to the market. The demand starts to grow and uh, we can see this in our analysis when we look at critical raw materials. So that's why we have lithium on the list in 2020. And uh, the list is a really wonderful tool we use for, for policy making, not only to know which raw materials are critical, but also to know where we source them from. And actually, when we look at this uh, this map here, we see where the which are the primary uh, sources of critical raw materials to Europe. Now, first of all, we see that most of them comes from one country, which is, which is China. The second thing is we see is that uh, <clears throat> for many critical raw materials, uh, the primary country is also the one that supplies the biggest amount of uh, raw materials. Yeah. So, for example, for lithium, we have Chile, which supplies 78% of the EU uh, of the EU supply. Right. We have also even more uh, dependence when it comes to borates, 89%. Similar when it comes to rare earths. Uh, magnesium, 
So there are countries which almost fully supply critical raw materials, or for example, uh, countries like Australia, which supplies only 20, only 20, 4% of coking coal, but still that percent is the biggest when it comes to one, one, uh, one country. And uh, in this list, we analyze uh, 83 materials. This time, they are various materials coming from industrial and construction minerals, iron and ferroalloy metals, precious metals, rare earth elements, other non-ferrous metals and bio and other materials. So we take into consideration quite many materials when looking what can be, uh, what could be critical and on what we would like to have more information. And as I mentioned, the methodology, we look at economic importance. So uh, how the material is important for the economic sectors in Europe uh, and the economy, and if it can be substituted, yeah, this, these are the, the various uh, aspects taken into the into the uh, indicator, and there was also the supply risk. So we, we look, for example, from which countries that, does that raw material come from? What is the situation uh, when it comes to that country? Meaning the government's performance. What is the import reliance? Do we have trade agreements? Are there any restrictions uh, on the import? What is the end of life recycling input rate? if there is a possibility of substitution. So we really take a lot of different indicators when, uh, when calculating this, uh, this criticality. And it, it is indeed a complex exercise uh, uh, to have it, but we try to have the data as reliable as possible and also comparable between different lists. So we, we want to really have uh, indication how uh, how, how, how the figures for the criticality change during the, the years we, uh, we have. And now, well, we have the list adopted last year. We are now already kick off the work for the 2030 list uh, on, um, on, on the critical raw materials. <clears throat> we have a project from Horizon, 20, Horizon Europe called Screen2, which helps us with uh, providing experts on criticality. Actually, the deadline for, uh, application, for, 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 for applications for external experts in the, uh, in the project has just already passed on uh, last, uh, last week. Uh, so this is one important thing. We also, with the list, to get also we uh, prepare a doc two documents on the fact sheets on critical on critical and non critical raw materials so we have two documents yeah and on each uh, on each of the analyzed 83 materials we provide uh, we ask experts uh, to provide us uh, all possible information on the availability, substitution, recycling possibilities, different figures uh, um, to, to, ha to, ha to have a full document on what are these actually raw materials and what they are used for. So that is a comprehensive document we also use for our uh, policy making and background information. And this is a public document, so you can also access it through our website and use it for your uh, purposes. This time we are also working on a foresight study. So it's already an indication that that will also appear in the next list and then material system analysis. And uh, I presented you the figures. I showed you how the, raw, how the demand will change, grow, and what is critical and where does it come from? So the question is, what does this actually mean? And I will, I will stay, pause a bit for, for this moment because uh, to show you one thing is to have these figures and know what's happening and why. But then again, we need to know what that means and what this means for politicians and for policy making institutions like the European Commission. This means that we need to act. Yeah. Uh, for example, today we had in the morning the MEP from the European Parliament. In the raw materials week, we had Vice President of the European Commission. We had also Comm Commissioner Breton. We even had three MEPs, which we never had in our meetings. And just this show you that there, and we also had the debate 
and the vote last week in the European Parliament on critical raw materials. So this is a very clear indication that raw materials are critical raw materials are in the political are in the interest of politicians. Yes, and uh, we can hear about critical raw materials. I hear about them every day in the radio, in the news, in the newspapers. I open. I don't know if it's just me, but. I, we see this uh, growing interest from politicians, but also from the public. And uh, this is a clear indication that we need to add, ask, uh, we need to act. I just mentioned the, the resolution from the parliament. They recognize that the demand for raw materials will be uh, rising due to the green and digital transition. Then they also recognize that recycling is not enough to supply the raw materials. So we would still need uh, primary raw materials as well. This is a clear political message from uh, the members of the European Parliament. So the Commission is, uh, has this policy on uh, raw materials. And uh, this is it. Last year, together with the Critical Raw Materials Swiss, we had adopted an action plan on critical raw materials, uh, listing 10 actions that we intend to, uh, intend to perform during the coming years. We already started immediately last year in September when this was adopted. And we started with adopting the European Raw Materials Alliance. It is run by the EIT raw materials, and they are working now in two clusters. One is uh, focusing on rare earths and permanent magnets. They just delivered recently their action plan on, on the supply of uh, rare earths and permanent magnets in Europe. There's an also another cluster, cluster two, which is focuses on raw materials needed for the energy, uh, energy technologies and devices. So this is the activity they are making and they are gathering uh, stakeholders and different projects that they could further support to be uh, delivered, yeah, investment projects. So this is a tool we, we have at our disposal. <clears throat> Then the second action, we are looking at sustainable financing criteria for mining. Action number three, it's on the research and innovation on waste processing, advanced materials and substitution. I will go into this uh, later as this is on RNI. So I will have more on RNI in my future slides. We are mapping the potential supply of secondary critical raw materials for EU stocks and waste as because uh, primary raw materials will be important, but we need to boost the secondary raw materials. And although the parliament said that the primary raw materials uh, will be still needed, they also at the same time pointed out that recycling is one of the great ch greatest challenges and uh, asked the commission to perform activity to boost recycling and help develop the markets for recycling in Europe. So one of the activities here is mapping the potential supply for secondary raw, uh, critical raw materials. Then the fifth action, identifying investment needs for mining projects that can be operational already in 2050. And this is an exercise we are performing with member states, looking at different raw materials and what are the projects that uh, could be developed there. And we are actually looking at lithium. I know my colleagues, are, I think, identified around 10 uh, projects right now that are, that are in a different stage of development. So we, the Commission is, is aware, of course, of, uh, of uh, the projects that uh, are considered by the investors uh, to be performed. And we are looking at the skills and expertise in the mining area, because in Europe, we have a lot of expertise, actually. We have many universities that develop students in the mining sector, metallurgy, and uh, we need to support that, to, to, have, to have that, um, have that uh, workforce and, uh, for, for the companies, but also for research. So that's something we need to, we need to uh, follow. Then, of course, we have the, the Earth Observations programs for exploration, operation, and post-closure environmental management. So we have also Earth Observation tools that the Commission is supporting that can be used in the raw materials area. Then we have action eight also again on RNI, this time on exploitation and processing of critical raw materials. We will look at it uh, later. 
then the action nine promoting responsible mining for practice of critical raw materials now here uh, and this links to lithium but not only lithium also other raw materials uh, we need primary sourcing from europe as well of course but we need to ensure that any mining activity in europe but also outside of europe from where we are sourcing from is done in a sustainable way with the least possible environmental impact, ensuring that all uh, uh, environmental legislation, but also the social aspects for workers are, are, um, are fulfilled by the project holders. So to facilitate this process, we have adopted recently uh, EU principles for sustainable raw materials. It is a document where we look at three aspects, the social, and principles, the environmental principles, and economic and government uh, uh, and governance uh, principles. So through this tool, we encourage all the project holders and investors to follow these rules in, in, in order to make sure that the projects are really not only de developing the, the projects for lithium, for example, that we need, but also that the lithium is actually produced in a sustainable way because that only this way we can ensure that this green transition really makes sense. And last point, number 10, developing strategic international partnerships to secure critical raw materials. So we see that the critical raw materials come from different parts of the world. And we want to work with international partners when it comes to this supply. Uh, and we carefully look at with whom you would like to have these, these links. So, for example, this summer we have signed partnerships with Canada and also with Ukraine. So these are the, the first two countries which we, we have already uh, institutionalized relations when it comes to uh, critical raw materials. And... Uh, I said we're going to talk about research and innovation. So as my last point in my presentation, I want to say how practically uh, we support raw materials projects also for lithium uh, when it comes to research and innovation. So, and I'm in a good position to do this because actually in, uh, my unit is uh, re responsible for, for raw materials policy and also the, the research and innovation side of this. So, uh, <clears throat> We, it is us uh, doing the programming here in this area. And uh, in Horizon 2020, in the previous, uh, previous framework program, we had around 600 million euros budget for raw materials action. We covered the full value chain. So exploration, extraction, processing, substitution, reuse, recycling, and recovery. And we also had few projects with policy support and networking and best practices. So. We, we have already that uh, since 2014, and uh, this, been, this has been working very well. And now we have the new program, which is uh, Horizon Europe from 2021-27. And you already see the change here. In the last program, we had 600 million. Now, just for the two first years, we have already 300 million. So you can see the budget is, has, grow, has proportionally grown already. Uh, so uh, the this is how the political interest turns into our particular uh, specific actions. And uh, we have adopted the work program already in June. The first uh, 21 calls are already closed. We already received uh, the applications, which are now being evaluated, uh, evaluated and uh, selected for uh, for funding. So this is in progress. We had six topics, and I think we expect around 15 projects from those uh, six topics. So this is something we would know uh, in the coming months. But there is also the second year of the work program 2022, and we have seven topics that are already open and the deadline is 30th of March. So if anybody of you is considering applying or see this is an opportunity, you have still a lot of time to prepare your application and look for, 
look for consortium partners. And I will show you a bit on what are the calls for raw materials. So we have seven calls uh, open right now. And uh, I will go uh, through each one of them just shortly to give you an overview what what is possible in the raw materials uh, research and innovation. Uh, I will not go into details here. This is a full site for your information after the meeting. It will be available, uh, the presentation. So we look when research and innovation in raw materials, we, for example, look at uh, uh, seabed uh, activity, but uh, here under this, sorry, the slide change. Uh, here we don't look at supporting seabed mining project. Now here under this project, we only intend to have a project that would develop a, a monitoring system and technology uh, for future exploitation in the deep sea. And we want the project to look just on, on the future potential environmental impacts. So we look, we, first we want to know exactly what will be the environmental impact before anything further can be done. So this is one example of the raw materials action. Second action we have is about networking and gathering good practices in the permitting, uh, permitting stage. So <clears throat> one of the problems, for example, in, in the mining area is that every country has different legislation and standards when it comes to permitting. Uh, uh, in the extractive process. So we intend to have a project that would gather these different uh, uh, different approaches from the member states and look if there are any possible good practices that could be disseminated uh, to facilitate this procedure to be more efficient, but also more transparent because one of the problems is of course consultation with the local, uh, local population. So that is a thing the project could focus on to make sure that the, what would be the good practices to involve more the environmental NGOs and the, uh, and the local uh, populations. Then third, we're looking at the digital side of the transition. How can the digital side help uh, extractive industries? So we are looking, for example, on uh, developing digital platforms that will help the industry gather the data they have, uh, process it and distribute among uh, different, uh, different stakeholders. So we look here at, at digital solutions. Then we have, uh, ah, and I will stop here for, for a longer moment because this is technological solutions for tracking raw materials flows and complex supply chains. We had the MEP today morning talking about the battery regulation, and this is exactly linked. This, top, this topic is linked to this uh, regulation because oh, uh, this topic is a tool we want to... Um, we want to use to support the battery regulation and support the industry by giving possibility to develop a system uh, for the traceability of raw materials. So this topic here is contributing to that regulation and will help provide technological solutions for traceability of raw materials in batteries. Then we have topic number five, sustainable and innovative mine on the future. So. We also fund projects that would make the mining more, envi uh, more environmentally, or let's say less environmentally damaging. So they would improve the, the performance of, in terms of environment and also uptake digital solution. Then we look at metallurgy, uh, metallurgical um, aspects and uh, recovery of uh, byproducts from raw materials. And the last topic is on Earth observation deployment. I will not go into detail about this. Uh, I remain here at the Q&A session to, op uh, to uh, respond to any questions you have. And my presentation will be available uh, after the meeting. So you can, uh, you, you can check it later if you're more interested in this topic. Uh, from my side, that will be everything for now. And I look forward to discussing with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel, for uh, your presentation. And we are glad to see that the European Commission is funding a lot of research in this area of the critical uh, materials, which is crucial for Europe. So now <coughs> I, I have to um, chair the discussion and I will be happy to do so. Unfortunately, Professor Anderson had to leave us, so we will be without him, but we will continue our discussion anyhow. And uh, I see a question uh, 
from Alessandra Quadrelli for uh, for John, I would say. Uh, probably you already answered it to the first one, but uh, the second one is new. But you can you can talk about both of them. Can we have an estimate between the current relative amount of lithium going to batteries versus lithium going to glass and glass ceramics? And maybe a rough estimate of projected growth of lithium going to glass, glass ceramic in the next decade. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a great question, uh, and I I jokingly had uh, some really good material that the uh, lawyers uh, took out of my slide presentation. I think if we look at the global scale of uh, 2020 lithium demand um, from an LCE perspective, uh, you know, roughly 300,000 metric tons. Uh, when you look at lithium carbonate specifically, uh, 2020 produced uh, somewhere in the order of 80,000 metric tons for glass and glass ceramics. Uh, lithium carbonate consumption takes roughly 10 to 20 percent of that. Uh, so it's a significant portion of the lithium carbonate space. When you rationalize that to the total LCE, uh, you know, that shrinks to around two to five percent. Uh, that's because we stay away from the hydroxides. Um, however, as we look in the future, uh, we see steady and persistent growth in glass and glass ceramics, uh, but nothing compared to the expected explosion of the EV uh, demand. Uh, so we expect to be significantly outpaced on a total LCE demand. Uh, however, uh, our position in the carbonate space uh, remains very important because we consider ourselves a stable and consistent buyer of a significant portion of the lithium carbonate. Uh, so we think the space uh, is critical and should be protected from the supplier's standpoint. Uh, as a stable output of lithium carbonate. Uh, but we do have worries about uh, the growth of the EV market and its impact on our supply as well. Good. Thank you very much. I, 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 may. I, I also have a question for you, uh, John. Uh, the, the regular glass, the one that we use for our bottles for wine, for milk, whatever, is advertised as the only material which is recyclable uh, an infinite number of times, okay? And that's right. sort of true, let's say. Um, what about the highly technological glass? W what about the recycling of Gorilla glass and so on? Can, can it be uh, uh, fused and then uh, uh, reused? Or what is the... What, what, tell us something about uh, this glass, please. Yeah, so we, we treat it just like any other more traditional uh, commodity types of glass. Uh, you know, the, the soda lime silicate or the bottles and window glasses uh, are very popular for their recyclability. Uh, even these technical glasses have the same remelt characteristics. Uh, we have to be very aware of uh, compositional control uh, as we blend that back into our glasses. Uh, our end properties are directly dependent on our composition control. Uh, and so that becomes something that has to be closely monitored and, and controlled for us. Uh, but the recycling ability of the technical glasses uh, is the same as the standard traditional glasses. Uh, glass ceramics uh, have uh, an extra layer of difficulty going through the ceram process. Uh, but still could be viewed as a recycled uh, content. Okay, thank you very much. Very good news. Uh, there is another question of uh, Alexandra Quadrelli, maybe, uh, well, tell me who, is, who wants to answer, maybe also even David Cole Hamilton, who is online, I think. On EU critical materials like bauxite, uh, titanium and strontium and lithium, uh, they are earmarked. Why? The latter two are also earmarked yellow and orange in the UCAS periodic table. Bauxite for aluminum, I assume, and titanium are not. They are, in fact, green. Any comments on these differences? David. Yeah, I, have a, I do have a comment. I mean, I think there are two possible reasons for this. Uh, and one of them 
you can you can switch on your test. I have done that. Yeah. One of them relates to the um, the question of what a critical raw material is relative to what we're doing in the table. So the table is really about absolute supply, and it doesn't take into account the political aspects of the supply chain. So for titanium and aluminium, the data that we have available, which is from 2011, so maybe a little bit out of date, is suggesting that there is no real source of problem with those two. So we look at aluminium, the amount of aluminium in the world, the amount that's being used, and we divide the one by the other and see what it's like but the supply chain may be completely different. It's, it's interesting how uh, for aluminium, uh, a small country in Africa, which is Guinea, is having a, a large proportion of our reserves worldwide. So that's, that's goes in the direction of the answer of, of David. So it's highly concentrated. So it is there, there is a lot of it, but it's concentrated and then it comes a problem for um, um, availability in terms of supply, in terms of, of, of European Commission policy, for example. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, please, please, David. Yeah, I just wanted to ask Daniel a question about rare earths, because you, you have both light and heavy rare earths on your critical raw materials. There was a major discovery in Japan in 2018 of a large deposit of rare earth elements. Do you take that into account? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, I would need to check with my colleagues who, who actually do the do the do the calculations. I it was 2018, so I'm not able to give you a definite answer at this at this point uh, exactly uh, if this was if this was uh, some something uh, w which was already in in the 2020 analysis. This is the reason that most of the rare earths are green in our periodic table. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for you, uh, Daniel. Uh, when you speak about the European Commission and you say these are critical for the European Commission and so on, but this is from your point of view. As, because after all, these uh, business are based between relationships between companies, I mean, a company making batteries in Germany, let's say, needs lithium from a company extracting lithium in Chile, for example. So how much of these problems depend on trade uh, relationship, on company relationship, and on political decision? So the two levels appears to be different. So which one you can control and which not, let's say. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. Uh, so uh, I think it's difficult to have control on this. Uh, it's not an easy process. And uh, well, you know, there are things that are dependent, of course, on company relations between companies. Yeah, that, that, is, that, is, that is one thing. On our side in the commission, like, well, we, we can facilitate somehow contacts yeah, between uh, stakeholders, especially from outside of Europe. We do that particularly uh, with the Canadians, uh, uh, with the PDAC uh, meeting every year. Uh, but we also try to facilitate these contacts uh, as well. So this is what we can do on the company level, yeah, uh, for different events. But when it, it, we have more possibilities when it comes interaction with on the governmental side with the public authorities. And uh, for example, if there are any trade restrictions uh, with diff from the, from different countries. This is something we can address. We did address that, that with the rare earths uh, in China with the VTO, for example. Uh, we can do that through the trade instruments we have, and this is something uh, that is at our disposal. We can also build partnerships with other countries like we did with Canada and Ukraine. Uh, to ha have it uh, pre prepared on the governmental level and then uh, have a forum to which we can invite uh, companies and the other stakeholders to build the relationships. So uh, this, is, this is what we can do. Uh, 
And of course, we have the list of critical raw materials for the EU, but of course, we are aware this is like EU 27 list. And uh, of course, every country in the EU has its own stru economic structure and different uh, actors there and producers. So, uh, of course, uh, some material might be critical for one country but won't be needed for another one yeah and we know some countries actually have their own list of critical raw materials or they call it strategic or uh, uh, important it also depends on their and they have different methodologies so this is indeed something uh, uh, on the eu level this is what we propose to have a tool of information for policy making but also for politicians because it's much easier discussing uh, a critical raw material identified by a methodology than just generally talking about uh, raw materials not knowing what exactly that is and where does it come from okay thank you uh, another uh, hot topic is is uh, deep sea mining that you mentioned uh, for example there are uh, research uh, uh, projects or uh, or open calls on that so is there, because it is, it is a very uh, hot issue and there is already a strong debate internationally on that because it can be dangerous for the, for the health of, of our seas, which are already having problems for climate change, for plastics and so on. So uh, what is uh, the current uh, uh, mood at the European Commission about the uh, exploitation of, of deep sea for mining? Yes, so when it comes to deep sea mining, we are of course aware that uh, there are different actors in different countries that are active in this area. And we are of course following the, the discussion here and we have colleagues who deal with this, uh, with this from our side uh, as well. Generally, we are very cautious when it comes to, comes to any activity in, in the deep sea because uh, we are aware of the environmental impact uh, of any activity. So we are very, very, very cautious with any moves here. And this is also one uh, of the reasons why we have a horizon call for, for a project that would monitor, develop technology for monitor this kind of impact because uh, we are not aware if already anybody started to look actually for from the environmental point of view before doing something uh, in the deep sea. So first we want to know the environmental impacts before any other actions uh, possibly could be taken. Okay, thank you very much. David, you have a, your raised hand, you have a question? Yes, please. Your mic is, is off. David? It's a question for Philippe. Yes. Uh, the atomic weight of sodium is uh, three times that of lithium, a bit more than that. Does that, that presumably means the batteries are heavier. Is, is that a significant concern? Um, no. <laughs> so, I mean, you're totally right. Of course, sodium is, is much more heavy than the lithium. But if you would basically do a, a split of the, of the battery and look where the, the mass is coming from, I mean, the alkali metal is, is having only a very small fraction. So I, th I think I showed this example of a, of a lithium ion battery for an electric vehicle. And this is 6.5 kilograms only of, of lithium compared to uh, many more kilograms uh, um, by, by other elements. So there's no, there's no let's say, uh, relevant effect, I would say, except maybe some super optimized systems where really the, the weight of the alkali metal may become more relevant. But for the normal systems, uh, that's not the that's not a key problem. No. Regarding sodium batteries, uh, Philip, uh, I've heard in Italy, for instance, but also somewhere else, probably, they uh, advertise. Some companies advertise uh, batteries which are called uh, kitchen salt batteries. I mean, it's probably sodium batteries, but this is an oversimplification because it is not only. Uh, sodium chloride. So can you explain the, the complexity of this in order to not uh, let people understand that it's like uh, using uh, the, the salt that you have in your kitchen? Um, yeah, good, good point. But uh, so I'm not, uh, 
sure what battery chemistry is exactly meant, uh, right, when having a kitchen salt batteries. But of course, people usually write sodium is abundant because it's it's from table salt, like sodium chloride. And uh, but to make a battery, you, you need much more, right? So I mean, also like this, uh, maybe some some people of the audience know this so-called zebra uh, battery, right, uh, where you basically have a, a nickel. Nickel and nickel chloride, and so on. So, you have basically chloride compounds. Uh, some people use aqueous batteries where you have, uh, let's say, an aqueous electrolyte, um, but there's always more to it. So, there's not something like a table salt battery, unfortunately. So, um, you always need much, much more uh, than that. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, I wonder if. Uh, one day we will extract uh, uh, the sodium res uh, resource from, from the sea. We could make two things in one, uh, two good things in one uh, action because we would have our resource for the batteries and also um, fresh water. That would be very important. I wonder if these two industries, desalination and uh, sodium batteries could be, uh, could work together in, in maybe in the distant future for on this because both problems are very uh, uh, relevant for our civilization in perspective. Yeah, I mean, so there are ideas to introduce, let's say, electrochemistry into desalination, right? So there, there are ideas on that. Um, as far as I know, they're not so so efficient yet. Um, some people even try to use battery electrodes of sodium ion batteries for this uh, electrochemical desalination. But um, as far as I know, it's very difficult to make a continuous process out of it that is uh, energy efficient and also allows really to reduce uh, the sodium chloride content significantly in the in the water. Because just removing a little bit uh, is, is of course not enough. Uh, and of course, you have all sorts of other ions in um, in, in water, so so in seawater. So uh, to be selective at the same time, I think that's a major challenge. Uh, but of course, this is something that is so sort of obvious, right? Uh, to to use electrochemistry, take out the sodium of, of seawater, um, purify water. Um, this is uh, uh, something that is being followed in the in the science community. Yeah. As an expert on on batteries, can you help us to clarify why one point? Because there is a lot of hype about graphene batteries. Okay. Can you can you tell us your opinion about this? The, the possibility that this material could be used uh, somewhere in one component of the battery, and what is the progress that could uh, bring or not bring? It is only hype. Can you please help us? Thank you. Yeah, that's of course a, a good question. So I have to say there are, there are many let's say nanomaterials right that are being researched uh, for for batteries and that perform very good in in the labs. So to say, but there's a big, big difference of what you can do in the lab and what you can really use in application. And typically, and I would count also graphene as one of these examples, is when you really you need grams, right, or kilograms, right. And and all these nanomaterials are are essentially very fluffy, right. So they have a very high volume, and all the volume that you put into a battery is essentially dead volume, right. If you have a lot of porosity, a lot of fluffy material. This, this void space is filled by electrolyte solution, and then you add extra weight. So when you put nanomaterials into a battery, usually you lose a lot of energy by volume, and you add extra weight because all the voids are filled with, with electrolyte solution. So uh, this is not basically completely limiting the use of nanomaterials, uh, but it shows that it's not trivial. So what sometimes looks good in the lab is not something that you uh, can easily use in application. And I think the best example is really graphite. I mean, graphite is a very old material, and it's still the, the anode material in lithium ion batteries. And um, it's, it's basically a boring material, so to say, but it's very difficult to replace it by, by something else. Do you think it will be ever possible to recover uh, uh, graphite from the anode? I mean, in a, in a business, uh, uh, to make a business case out of this uh, recycling, or at the end it will be, it will go in the in the black part that will be not recycled during uh, um, pyrometallurgical or hydrometallurgical recovery. Yes, yeah, so right now it's being burned right in the recycling process, and uh, I, I I mean 
usually battery graphite sells roughly around for around ten dollars per kilogram let's say battery grade um, uh, graphite so ten dollars per kilogram is is not a lot let's say in terms of if you do all this recycling and you need to be cost competitive unless there are not other basically incentives to to make it financially attractive but of course there's a lot of effort i mean graphite when you basically mine it you need to purify it and there's a process called spherodization so you get your graphite and you have to shape it to to round particles and there's a lot of loss so there's a lot of waste graphite in, in this process so you lose a lot of material and um, i think that it would be of course nice to recycle it um, but right now the cost of graphite is relatively cheap so that's why probably people focus more on cobalt and nickel where you basically have a, a business case so to say yeah it is very cheap but all, almost all of it is coming from china so we have any of the strategic problems so that's that's a complicated yeah yeah absolutely uh, are there any other questions i have another one actually but uh, I, I wait for any other questions coming from the audience. David. I have one more question for Daniel, and it's to do with substitution. I noticed you had some projects on substitution. Are you ramping that up? So what by that I mean replacing these critical raw materials with earth abundant and readily available metals and so on. So for example, in glass screens, people are trying to develop new touchscreen materials, which don't include indium. But do you have big ambitions in that area? Well, <clears throat> indeed, we, we have been funding already projects on substitution. And uh, well, uh, most of the Horizon 2020 projects are still ongoing. So that is something still on, in the research stage. So uh, I don't think we have any uh, particular uptakes already by the industry. but that is to be to be checked but in principle we are funding substitution projects as well as uh, when it comes both to the battery projects uh, battery partnership in the horizon europe and uh, they are working on uh, substitution as well and uh, also uh, <clears throat> when it comes to rare earths in permanent maxes that is something uh, uh, coming from the European Raw Materials Alliance Action Plan. So, so we, we will be looking at that. And of course, substitution is one of the one of the ways of securing the raw materials supply. And that is both highlighted in, in our critical raw materials action plan, but also last week, uh, a point made by the European Parliament that we need to also focus a lot of substitution. So that is indeed one of our, our our uh, options uh, to use and we, we, we are uh, looking at it as well. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Paul Anderson, but he's not here. So I ask uh, to the audience if anyone can help me to understand. As, uh, there was any progress in the last uh, years about the disassembling of batteries. I mean, are we getting smarter in making batteries which can be more easily disassembled and then recycled? Or in this area, we are not making progress and still we are poised to have problems in the in the in the recycling. Daniel, do you have any clue? Well I can, I can say that in, indeed the, the, the recycling of batteries is something we need to develop in Europe. That is uh, because uh, that will be a significant uh, source of raw materials. And uh, that is, that, that is some, something we need to develop and we are supporting that uh, on the research side and investment side. And there are companies in Europe who, who are working on this, uh, on this, on this kind of facilities uh, to be operational in the coming years. So, this is something we need to have in Europe, yeah? Uh, this uh, recycling and also the disassembly. So indeed, it, uh, it, it, these devices sh sh should be done in a way that they're easy to dismantle and then uh, ready for, for the recycling purposes. Yes. Uh, I have a um, final question to... to everybody let's say <laughs> um, we have discussed about availability of, of lithium and other raw materials as well today 
And uh, after all, after this discussion, I'm not extremely concerned about the availability of lithium. So we have to be very careful. We have to implement the, the circular economy. That's clear. Everyone agrees on that. My question is, since we have to expand the production of batteries in, 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 with, in very big numbers, we have seen several uh, diagrams today. Let's say we expect that the, the, the battery production will need to be increased by 20 times in maybe 10, 20 years, which is a huge amount. So the, my, my question and my concern is, will be the industry at the world level be able to scale up so fast to be able to catch up to this increase which is needed? Because this is what concerns me. Because if I go to a company and, and say, you have to expand your production by 20 times in 10 years. I mean, they are shocking, you know, it's not easy. So how can we manage this acceleration that we need? So this is a question that I ask to everyone who wants to give his own advice. Thank you. I can maybe start uh, yeah. with, uh, with that, that question. And we see that demand will be growing for lithium. And uh, uh, at the same time, we see there is a lot, there's a huge interest and in actually on uh, developing projects in the lithium sector and the extraction. So we see diff diff different, different uh, pro project proposals coming and uh, we see junior companies or more developed companies thinking about these projects. So this is something which is in the pipeline and uh, these companies need of course, uh, build a business case, build a business plan, uh, perform all the environmental analysis and obtain the permits. So that is a long process. And we see different projects on a different stage moving to, to that direction. We see also pro like different companies already signing uh, memorandum of understanding of supply of lithium. So different automotive producers and some lith lithium projects are already signing some, some documents that promising that they will provide that supply. So we see that is growing. And we are, for example, supporting this through the European Battery Alliance, which has a tool of supporting these kind of uh, lithium projects, but also through the European raw materials. That's, that, that's financial and technical support is, uh, uh, is possible and also with building up the business case. Yes. Philip, do you have any uh, comment on this? Yeah. yeah, you raised a very good point, and this is being discussed because it's really, I mean, you, you mentioned this, this really rapidly growing market, and at the same time, we have to ensure that the recycling is also being built up. Um, and uh, I mean, a normal, let's say, car manufacturing site uh, produces several thousand cars per, per, per week, but this means at some point several thousands of battery packs are returning. And uh, how to how to manage that? And the, I, I think the, the big chemical companies and so on, and the car manufacturers, they are aware, of course, of this uh, situation, um, and they are working hard, I think, in, in to to try trying to set up, let's say, a, a solution. Um, but I completely agree. This sounds like a, a massive challenge, and this is maybe also in the positive sense also a, a chance for opportunities, right? For for new ideas, um, um, but it's for sure actually. Sounds like a really big challenge, yeah. Yeah. I fully, fully agree. We have really exciting times ahead of us. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. David? Yeah, just a, a big comment on that. Of course, we had a similar very rapid rise in the use of uh, smartphones, and people stepped up to the plate and they made them. And uh, it's not just the current companies that will make them, there will be new companies. And if we don't do it here, it will be done in the Far East. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I think, uh, well, uh, 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 we have another question. Uh, one from Denise uh, Cerrone. Does it make sense to talk about hydrogen vehicles as an alternative to EV to overcome a different uh, criticalities of lithium? Uh, yes, please, uh, Weber, uh, Philip. Maybe I can make a start. Um, 
I mean, first of all, I think it's it's great that we have basically two technologies that that work. So I mean, electric vehicles work, right? Of course, we have all these issues around it and so on. But technologically, these cars uh, work, and also fuel cell cars uh, now reach the state where where you could say, well, this is really working as an as a car. And I think this is first of all a, a great thing. But the common understanding right now, also from the last years, is that it's simply efficiency-wise simply not possible to to run a lot of fuel cell cars right because we we lose too much energy in transforming from electricity to hydrogen and transforming backwards and that's um, i think probably not the right path at the moment what is maybe happening in 10 20 years i think nobody knows and that's why i think it's great to have this technology the technology available but i think right now uh, the, the battery electric vehicle is simply having is a head of, of, of fuel cells Yes, David. I think that's right. There's also a question about the supply of hydrogen at the moment and where it comes from. And until we have green hydrogen massively available, it's not really viable. I mean, the blue hydrogen is okay, but you know there are problems with sequestering CO2 that people haven't really resolved, as you know very well, Nikon. So, uh, I mean, I think hydrogen hydrogen cars will be great. When they can can be done, but we have to have the hydrogen and a proper network to supply it. I can also say my opinion. Um, uh, it is evident that uh, hydrogen cars are at least three times less efficient than battery cars. So, uh, for light duty vehicles, I think that the game is over. Uh, it will be battery vehicles, from car to bikes uh, to motorbikes and so on. For uh, heavy uh, duty vehicles, the game is open. I have spoken recently with uh, representatives from the automotive industries. At present, let's say December 2021, uh, there is no clear evidence whether the uh, hydrogen fuel cell or the battery uh, uh, um, trucks will prevail. I think that probably battery will be a winner also here, but it's it's not sure at the moment. It's really a, 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 a crucial moment, and maybe in two or three or five years we will know more clearly which will be the the destiny of the heavy duty vehicle sector. At present, it is a quite uncertain. There is a question of um, Rinaldo Poli for John Cochran. Is there any research effort at Corning to develop? Uh, Sorry, to develop glass ceramics of equal or satisfactory performance that are less dependent on lithium? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, Corning, as, as well as everyone, is constantly innovating, right? So we're looking both in the composition space uh, as well as the uh, manufacturing processes, right? And so as we investigate uh, or go down the innovation discovery path, uh, we're looking at the elements that we consume, uh, the compositional impact that we have, uh, and also the manufacturing processes that we can create uh, to help us avoid some of these criticals. Uh, you know, I, I think everyone can say the pace of innovation can be tied to supply and demand. Uh, I think as we continue to see tightness in uh, lithium uh, and prices that follow that, uh, it's possible that innovation can uh, expedite. So. Thank you, John. There is a question from uh, Aan Tan. He's asking, do you think that batteries companies need to have a standardized battery pack model? Having different battery packs is really difficult to recycle. And this is a real problem. Absolutely. So maybe is there any uh, work by the European Commission to try to help to go to a more standardized market? Because this would help a lot. Uh, because you have to make, there are three different types of batteries. So you have three disassembly line and it's, it's very expensive. It would be great to have one, but I know that it's in the hands of the companies. Uh, Daniel? Uh, yes, thank you. Well, when it comes to batteries, uh, uh, I, I can re reply that we have the battery regulation proposal. I think that's the main tool we can we can use here uh, uh, to incentivize and, and to sh shape how the industry goes. So uh, depending on the final shape of the proposal, now it is at, at the European Parliament, and I think I think. Uh, 
that 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 is something to that could be addressed in the in the regulation proposal and uh, we will see what will be the final shape of the document and uh, and we we expect that to be adopted by the end of uh, next year Philip? Yeah, maybe, maybe also um, uh, comment on that. So maybe another viewpoint. I mean, of course, standardization sounds sounds good in the sense of making recycling easier. But at the same time, I think one has to be aware that it's uh, basically slowing down innovation, so to say. Because if every car company uses the same battery pack and so on, they and and the battery is a, is a huge part of the cost of a of a uh, of a car. They first of all lose a little bit of their identity, right? Because if Everybody uses the same battery, so what's the what's the quality mark of a Mercedes, right, or or, or another mark? So the, 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 I think the battery itself is something that the companies want to have their their own one. And uh, as I said, for innovation, it's sometimes a bit difficult because you know if you have too much standardization, it's very difficult to come up with a radically different design. And this is something right now that really happens. So there's BYD, which is also one of the largest lithium-ion battery manufacturers worldwide. And they have a basically a new cell design. So in the talk from Paul Anderson, you saw you go from a cell to a module to a pack. And this company now is simply they, they skip on they skip the module step. So they go from the cell to pack. It's called cell to pack technology. And this, for example, makes lithium ion phosphate uh, batteries more now viable for electric vehicles, right? But only because they have a new cell design. Um, and therefore they, they have a business case, so to say, or, or a unique selling point. So that's always the bit the, the counterpart. So I think standardization is good for recycling, but at the other side, I think companies prefer to have some freedom to uh, develop, let's say, better batteries. Sure, this is a very important point. Thank you for pointing this out. And there is a comment from Christophe Coperi who says that the one should not forget uh, hydrogen explosion uh, uh, problems. So, in fact, there is a lot of regulation to be made also about uh, hydrogen transportation, distribution, and usage. So, th this is something that is, uh, has to be elaborated also at the European level, of course, which is uh, not the case uh, to a large extent with batteries. There is a question from Klaus uh, Kummerer. I think we have to think broader how much um, mobility will uh, we need or want and how much can we afford. Parts of the future probably is also to reduce the total materials and product flows. How does the panel see this? Maybe Daniel, what about the reduction of the, the production of cars? So less cars in the future. That's probably our future and we hope it will be so. But what's your opinion? Well, uh, one thing is uh, just the, the, the growing growing. Uh, demand for different technologies and also the grow, growing amount of people and population which will of course need more consumption but it is indeed looking at the consumption modern uh, models and patterns is also one of the way way forward uh, looking at if we need indeed need all of these devices if if anybody needs to have finds five phones instead of one that is uh, for example a possible option and that is also a voice in this discussion should we uh, consume somehow less or consume in a more smarter way that is uh, that is uh, an open issue mm, of course uh, here uh, there is uh, Christophe Kofere who points out that uh, he meant uh, uh, um, combustion engine made uh, run by hydrogen. I think this is what he meant. I don't think that's a good idea we, in general. Uh, <laughs> making hydrogen, with, which is so valuable, you need 55 kilowatt hours of electricity to make one kilogram of hydrogen, which means that to, to, to make... Uh, uh, the, to, to fool uh, the tank of the of, of a hydrogen car, uh, you need uh, about six kilograms of hydrogen. So it is over 300 kilowatt hours of electricity. That's that's a precious material. So it's not a good idea to burn it. That's that's my personal idea. Um, uh, Can I just ask you on that question? Uh, is it more efficient to have? Uh, fuel cell than to have a combustion engine from hydrogen? 
I think it is more efficient to have full cell because at the end you have an electric uh, engine, so that that works much better. If you if you burn it, you have uh, the usual uh, 70 80 percent inefficiency that you cannot limit it. Instead, with the full cell, it's it's much better. Um, Um, as a great amount, a, a question from Giuseppe Musumara. As a great amount of lithium is needed by automobile batteries, a possibility would be to reduce consumption by a policy aimed at increasing drastically public transportation as compared to private cars, although not appreciated by car industry, which you should focus on. I think that my personal view is that uh, uh, it's this is true for for metropolitan areas, absolutely. I mean, our cities must be less full of cars and more full of, of bus, trains, metros, and so on. But there are millions of people living uh, in, 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 in rural areas. And in that case, it's, it's more complicated. So I think we will never get rid of, of private uh, uh, transportation, of course. But definitely, I, I totally agree on that. If there is any other one who wants to say anything on this, Apparently, no. Uh, what is the difference in lithium amount between car and bus batteries? Anyone who knows about that? Uh, Philip? Um, yeah, I mean, I think just as a rough indicator, so I showed the example of a 60 kilowatt hour battery containing roughly six kilograms of lithium, right? Um, and then you simply need to scale that uh, because of, for a bus, of course, you need larger battery packs and then you simply scale the number. Um, so uh, I don't think they use a completely different cell chemistry. I mean, buses usually use this uh, lithium ion phosphate technology, but the amount of lithium is then roughly the same. So um, uh, I think you can simply scale with the battery capacity to get a rough number. Yeah. Another question by Klaus Kummerer. However, if there is too much innovation, we might run into problems how to circulate and recycle the individual types of products. Yes, yes, we have to find, uh, you know, uh, a trade-off and, and we have to try to compensate everything. Uh, there is a question by Gianluca Torta. As Philip Adelheim said, a new pack designed for uh, lithium iron phosphate has been developed in China that increases a lot the energy density of lithium phosphate, uh, iron phosphate batteries. The energy density is almost the same as NMC battery, but they are safer and cheaper. So why they should NMC battery prefer to LFP batteries right now? So I, I try to, to answer that. So, I mean, um, this is, of course, a race now. So we have different battery chemistries. And a few years ago, people thought that lithium ion phosphate batteries will probably not make it into electric vehicles because the energy density of these batteries is actually smaller than NMC. But with a new pack design, basically, uh, LFP batteries now become very interesting again. So the race is on. And uh, I think what Gianluca also mentions, so they're close to NMC batteries, but not not there yet so uh, and what i know basically let's say from the community is that nmc batteries will have still a higher energy density so probably they will aim for premium cars let's say maybe for extra high driving range or at extra large driving range but if you want to have very cost effective cars um, then probably lithium ion phosphate batteries are, are uh, the better choice i mean they're probably last longer I don't know whether they can be more easily recycled. This is something I don't know. Uh, the price is lower, uh, but apparently they have maybe at the moment still a, a, a poor or low temperature performance. So um, we have maybe if you look at the battery, 20 parameters, right, that uh, make a good or bad battery. And uh, some of these cell chemistries perform better in, in one or the other uh, um, parameter. So um, they are not the same batteries. They're both very good. Uh, and I think the race is on, and let's see uh, what what will happen. But likely NMC will be for premium cars and LFP for for uh, more economic uh, economic cars. That's the the present understanding, as far as I as I know. What I can say is that they have an LFP car, and there is the same exactly the same car with the MC NMC battery, and my cars 
is uh, 100 kilograms heavier than the NMC because the density of the battery is lower. So it is possible to have both, but you have uh, two different features. And uh, in terms of, of duration and then robustness and uh, even safety, they say LFP is better. So one last question from uh, Bojan Radak, because uh, we are running out of time and we have the final words from our president. There are fuel cells that run on hydrogen from alcohol. Yes, indeed, that's true, but uh, then you have to make the alcohol. So that's, that's a problem. And uh, it's not easy to make uh, alcohol that you should make uh, possibly from uh, bio-based uh, um, feedstocks because otherwise you go back to the, to the fossil fuel. So that's, that's not easy. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on that. Uh, David? Well, it is generally still a carbon-based fuel, so the carbon dioxide has got to go somewhere. Yeah. Okay, so I thank uh, very much the speakers of this afternoon for the extensive discussion. Uh, and I want to thank everyone. Let me remind the, the name of the people that participated to our discussion today. Simona Bonafè from the European Parliament, David Cole Hamilton, uh, Fe Fernando Rocha, Cristina Edstrom, Luigi Lanuzza, Catherine Sanderson, Philip Adelhelm, Paul Anderson, John Cochran, and Daniel Chos. I want to thank you very much. It was a great day and we will be glad to, to distribute this. The video will be available on, on YouTube on our channel of the European Chemical Society. And uh, uh, so we, there will be more uh, people looking at it besides the 100 or 200 people that uh, watch it uh, live today. And uh, we give you an appointment for next uh, spring. We have not yet fixed the date, but we will have another webinar on nitrogen and phosphorus. So we will move from, let's say, cars and renewable electricities and technologies, glass and so on, to food, basically. And that's another key issue for our future. So I stop here and I... Uh, Thank very much also the Secretariat in Brussels uh, with uh, Nineta, with Laura and, uh, and, and Anna. Uh, without their work, uh, we, we, we wouldn't be here, of course. And uh, I leave now the stage back to our president, uh, Floris Rugis, for a final address. And I say you goodbye. Thank you for listening. Please. Yeah, come. thank you very much, uh, Nicola. Um, there's not so much time left. That means that I shouldn't make it uh, too long, which I won't. But I definitely hope that you all enjoyed uh, today as much as I did. Um, um, we had a very nice talk, very different talks, very uh, many different viewpoints to look at, uh, at, at lithium and also very good discussions uh, at the end of the morning and at the end of this, of this afternoon. I, I also learned a lot, I must say, being, being an organic chemist by training. Um, I, for example, I was not aware of the fact that electric cars are so much um, more energy efficient than, than uh, well, uh, conventionally fueled cars. Um, but there were many, many other things that I learned. Um, it's also good to see that many things are on ongoing and also on the policy level um, in, in Europe uh, that there are many things going on and that, that uh, this all is really on the on the political agenda. Um, for the, the task groups, the task group on the UCAMS periodic table, it's also clear that there's some work to do. It seems that we, um, after carbon, now we also need to change the color of, of lithium. So that is something for, for, for us to work on. And indeed, also the, the webinars that are coming up. Um, so we'll start uh, organizing the next one uh, right away uh, after this one, uh, I think. Um, in addition to, to Nicola, I would like to thank the, the speakers. I also would like to thank the task group members. Uh, Nicola already uh, mentioned their names, but I would like to thank uh, Nicola Armaroli in particular for his role in the task group and for chairing this, this event today. 
He has also been re-elected in the executive board of uh, or executive board of the European Chemical Society. So I think we are uh, sort of assured of um, a continuation of his uh, services in this respect. But um, many thanks, um, um, Nicola, uh, for all your work and also your con contribution again uh, today. And also from my side, I would like to thank uh, Laura and Anna and Nineta, um, who are indeed doing a lot of work on, on in the background. You, so you probably saw their names all the time on the screen. So they are there. You don't see them, but um, they are uh, very important for uh, running and hosting this, uh, this entire event. Um, having said that, I think um, I pretty much have said everything that I wanted to say. Um, so um, I propose to, um, to leave it at this point. Uh, thank you all for your attendance. And um, um, please um, keep uh, alert for uh, the next webinar, I would say. Thank you very much.